Chapter 10, The Committee Ari looked at his watch. In exactly seven minutes and thirty seconds, he would make a call from a certain payphone near the Eiffel Tower to another payphone somewhere in Paris, where Jean-André, one of his many couriers, would be at that precise time. Then he would go to another payphone to make a similar call to a payphone in his old town of Leipzig, where Heinz Bühne, his right-hand man in that area, would be waiting at that exact moment. Coincidentally, Leipzig would be the center for the movement in East Germany when the time came, not because Ari wanted it that way, for sentimental reasons, but because that was the way it was going to happen. There were 14 calls he had to make in the next three hours, each to a different country and from a different phone. That done, Ari would station himself at a precise time at yet another payphone, where his agents knew they could reach him if necessary. Tomorrow it would be a different phone and a different time for them to call, and so forth, according to a schedule that was changed weekly. In his briefcase, Ari carried the numbers and locations of about 300 payphones in Paris, with an unpredictable calling schedule that he had worked out for himself and that he continually changed at random. Public phones were his communications hotline. Hundreds of cartes téléphoniques, which could be purchased in tobacco shops and had to be used in most public phones in Paris, along with coins or jetons for those instruments that still required them, resided with wrenching weight in his briefcase as well. Mail was a more difficult problem. Ari sent and received little and never anything of great importance. Mail was far too slow and vulnerable. Fax machines were instantaneous, and it was impossible for the police or any other agency to monitor every fax machine. With an elaborate and changing schedule governing which machine to use and messages to be picked up by couriers, Ari had kept such communications secure. Extraordinary precautions were absolutely essential in order to stay alive and to protect his key people. Faxing was even a viable means of getting messages in and out of China, which had been a surprise to Ari when he had first discovered that welcome fact. There was, of course, a payphone where his directors of operations around the world could reach him at any hour of the day or night. It was monitored in shifts, eight hours on, 16 off, by three couriers who had a number where they could reach him at any time. They didn't know where Ari lived or who he was. Any message they received at that phone would be in simple code, either conveying urgent information or asking Ari to call immediately and would be passed on to him verbatim. How much easier it would have been to do all this from his own apartment, but Ari knew there was no such thing as a secure phone. What one genius could contrive, another one could figure out, and the people he had to keep one step ahead of had unlimited resources and the world's most advanced technology at their disposal. What might be secure in the world of business would not make it in the world of international intrigue. No, he could not afford to take a chance. One slip was all it would take. Roger was no real friend, but a triple agent, prepared to double-cross both him and the committee in order to fulfill CIA orders. Not that it really mattered. Roger could do nothing for him, even if he wanted to. The men over him, whether in Washington or Paris, were utterly ruthless. Of that, Ari was certain. Some publicity-hungry junior U.S. senator is pushing the investigation, and he's just ambitious enough to keep at it until he causes some real trouble. The speaker, a tall, intense man with chiseled features and aristocratic bearing, was sitting at the head of a long, ornately carved teak table in the opulent boardroom of the Paris office of one of the world's largest and most prestigious banks. The huge 20th floor windows on two sides of the room looked out upon a panorama of the city from the Eiffel Tower to Sacre Coeur. Is that all you've got today, Jean? Bad news? complained a short, jolly man at the other end of the table. Nervously, he shifted the dead cigar clamped between his teeth. Are you saying that a hundred thousand dollars or a high-class prostitute and a little blackmail won't take care of him? Not a chance, returned Jean Bourbonnet gloomily. He was apparently in charge, though a formal meeting had not begun as yet. The five men seated around the table, all wearing conservative, well-tailored suits, had been conversing casually, apparently waiting for someone to join them. He's had a swarm of auditors from the World Bank sifting through records at our Panama branch. They suspect our connections with Noriega. 
When Manuel worked for the CIA, he was their fair-haired boy. But now that he's in jail, they're scrambling to cover up and put the blame somewhere else. I thought our people in Washington had everything under control, objected a swarthy director from the bank's head office in Dhaka, who was sitting just to Jean's right. In theory, Zaid, in theory, responded Bourbonnais, but damage control never works as well in North America or Europe as in Pakistan. Don't worry, he added in a soothing tone. Nothing will come of it. And if it does, we have foolproof methods. Jean Bourbonnais lifted a hand and waved a long manicured finger in response to the worried expressions that followed his last remark. Yes, I know, we've brought down enough passenger jets. That's still an option, but only in the rarest circumstances. There are ways that even an autopsy would never uncover. So relax, you look like a bunch of pallbearers. I may need some of that specialized help. The words came from the other end of the table. The cigar chewer was wiping beads of sweat from his forehead with a large initialed linen handkerchief. They're sniffing around like bloodhounds on a hot trail, trying to trace drug money from New York back to Columbia through my branch. So, Barry, they finally come to Miami? I'm sure they'll find your operation as clean as a hound's tooth, quipped the short, stocky man to his left in a heavy German accent. Just keep them away from Zurich as a personal favor to me. It's not a joke anymore, Heinz. Bourbonnet glanced at his diamond-studded platinum Rolex. We'll discuss these problems later. First of all, we want to get Dunn's report. He should be here any minute. We can't keep pouring millions in without some control. I've been saying that for years, grumbled a short, portly man with a florid face and worried expression across from Zaid. It's a bottomless pit, and time is running out. The bloodhounds are breathing on my neck in London. Agreed, conceded Hines, but nobody's come up with a solution. The guy always outmaneuvers us. How do we take control? You've got to admit, he's done an incredible job, suggested Barry. He did, for the first few years, complained the worried Londoner, but I want to see some action. It's long overdue. Patience, he keeps saying. Patience. I say we dump that arrogant Jew. Sounds of assent swept around the table. You're going to get some action in the next few days, put in Bourbonnet. I just had a communique from Washington an hour ago. The CIA's in complete agreement with our appraisal. We're cleared to go ahead in China. It'll work, exulted Zaid. Any Asian could tell you that. Now's the time. Shang Li has a huge student following, continued Zhang. They're going to take over Tiananmen Square. Mueller's top guys, whoever they are, have to go along with it. With Mao gone and a power struggle underway, and millions of workers ready to go on strike across China as soon as the students make their move, the regime will fall apart. They're already quarreling among themselves. There's new leadership in the wings, ready to take over. Not exactly what we'd want, but a big improvement. I know China, said Zaid. I've lived there. And I know the way the Chinese think. Two steps forward, one step backward. Even if there is a crackdown, with martyrs, if we can hold Tiananmen long enough for the people to get a strong taste of freedom, they won't forget. It will be the foundation for two more steps forward later. We'll do better than that, insisted Bourbonnet. The old guard will be swept from power. This thing has incredible momentum. Chang Li has a genius for leadership. He may even end up somewhere in the top echelons of political power. So much the better for us. So if we can pull this off without Mueller's people, why do we need him anywhere? The question brought enthusiastic nods of approval and a fist slammed down here and there around the table. It's not that simple, Bourbonnet persisted. This is the culmination of years of Mueller's work. He laid the foundation. Chang would like us to believe that he's the whole show but that isn't true. That's right, agreed Hines. The professor is still indispensable. For now. For now, repeated Zaid. I can see the day coming, and it isn't far off when we won't need that yid anymore. The door swung open, and a secretary ushered in Roger. Glumly, he settled into an empty seat across from Hines. Well, asked Jean Bourbonnet impatiently. He's not going to give us any information. None. Period. And you accepted that, came the angry challenge from several voices at once, accompanied by expletives from around the table. You threatened to cut off his funds, of course. Jean was clearly anxious. Sure I did, and he called my bluff, handed back the money. He did? You didn't keep it? I finally calmed him down and got him to take it. 
You can't pressure Ari. We found that out before. He's like steel. The more heat you apply, the harder he gets. Oh, how I want to get rid of that snake, growled Zaid through his teeth. He's had us over a barrel for years. Easy, cautioned Roger. We can't get along without him. Not yet. And he knows it. And he just might be able to get along without us. He threatened as much. He's made those threats before, grumbled Jean, and I've never doubted that he meant it. We can't push him too far. But China, we're going to do it there, exclaimed Hines with a note of triumph. If there, why not elsewhere? Not really, countered Roger. Chang is riding on Ari's coattails. Of course, if it works, then we'll have a pattern for elsewhere. There was a long silence. At last, Hines spoke. When the wall comes down and Gorby's perestroika has come full circle, our arrangement with Ari terminates. He's finished in good riddance. Zaid looked across the table into Roger's eyes. You have any problem with that, Dunn? Roger shrugged his shoulders. Nope, not at all. The guy's been a pain. He knows too much, and I suspect that he knows a lot more about our whole operation than we think he does. What makes you think that, demanded the heavy British accent, reflecting heightened alarm. Nothing in particular, just remarks he makes now and then. He's made his own funeral arrangements. Bourbonnet's words were cold, matter of fact. I was at CIA headquarters in Langley last week. They're positive now that he's planning the same tactics in the West as soon as communism crumbles. He won't live to see it. We'll be finished with him by then. He's got his own agenda, added Hines. No loyalty to us. We've always known that. The sooner we get rid of him, the better. Careful now, interjected Roger. Don't rush it. We still need him. If someone takes him out too soon, everything could collapse. Langley knows exactly what to do, but they won't act until we tell them. When we all agree it's time, Bourbonnet motioned with a closed fist and thumb pointed down. He turned to Roger. Something's bothering you? Ari says Chang's pushing it too fast and it isn't going to work. The florid face of the director from London turned several shades redder. Baloney! That's the same line we've heard from him for years. Patience and more patience. He's jealous of Chang, afraid we can get along without him. The guy's an organizational genius, countered Roger. He's incredible, has his finger on the pulse, and he's always been right. This time he's wrong, cut in Jean sharply. Has he brainwashed you, Dunn? Look, I'm not siding with him. Roger shifted uncomfortably in his chair. But I'd be remiss if I didn't pass on to you what he said. He warned me there'd be a massacre if we didn't pull Chang off immediately. He said Berlin and Moscow have to come first, then Beijing. That's another nail in his coffin, snarled Bourbonnet, slamming his fist on the table. He's always right. Nobody else knows anything. Well, this time he's wrong. When we prove it in Beijing and the wall comes down and communism collapses across Eastern Europe, it's goodbye, Professor Mueller. Jean Bourbonnet put on his silver-rimmed glasses, opened a folder marked Damage Control that had been sitting on the table in front of him, and began to meticulously look through it while the others waited. Now then, he announced at last, we've got some serious problems to deal with.